Welcome to the Debit This, Credit That podcast with Wheeler Accountants located in San Jose, California. In this podcast, we discuss how to solve accounting challenges in both your personal life and your business. We take an energetic, tech-savvy approach to solving accounting challenges that steal your focus and your time. Now, on to the show with your tech-savvy accounting experts, Matt Wheeler and Michael Bryant. Hello and welcome to episode 14, preparing for an initial financial statement audit with Michael Bryant, audit partner at Wheeler Accountant. So Michael, we're going to dive into this pretty deep here. What is the first step that people need to do to prepare for this initial financial statement audit? You know, when I was preparing for this podcast, I was thinking about a book that I'm reading right now, which is called The Five Second Rule by Mel Robbins. And what she talks about is that we we make decisions with our feelings and we're concerned about things that, you know, we have these perceptions in our mind. And so many people are terrified when they hear the word financial statement audit. It's just, oh my gosh, an audit is so scary. It's going to be so difficult so painful. But the truth is that we can actually streamline that process and make it much, much easier than one would imagine. And what we're going to talk about today is ways to actually make that process easier and things that you can do to help prepare yourself. Why is this important overall? You know, a financial statement audit is important because it it provides independent third-party verification of your financial statements. And it really builds a history. So when you're using a reputable firm, you will have a audit that you can present to banks, to um, investors, to other sources, and they can know that your financial statements have been audited and that they are materially correct. So this is really, really important. Absolutely. It's something that that should be taken very seriously. And uh, we uh, at Wheeler Accountants take it very seriously and, and enjoy providing this service to our clients. So why is a financial statement audit really important? Well, you know, organizations need financial statement audits for different reasons. It could be in regards to their ownership or the structure of their company. It could be a lender requirement or a legal requirement, such as in the state of California. We're required to have audits for nonprofits over $2 million in revenues. Over $2 million in revenues. So that's a that's a pretty steep line in the sand, isn't it? Yeah. So as soon as they jump over the $2 million revenue mark, the state of California is saying, hey, look, nonprofits, you're large enough that you need to be getting an audit. We need some third party verification of that. And this this varies state by state. There are some states that require audits over $500,000 in revenue, and there's other states that don't require audits at all for nonprofits. Gotcha. Okay. So where do, where do we go from here? So now I know that it's important for me to have this financial statement audit. What do I do now? Yeah, what, one more thing that I wanted to add that is an underlying benefit of having an audit is as part of our audit procedures, we're required to look at internal controls. And so we can really help management improve and streamline the operations by evaluating those internal controls. And we have a recommendation letter at the end of our audit that we present to management. And with those can be implemented and and really streamlined and make effective internal controls. Gotcha. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. All right. So now, now what? Where do we go from here? Well, in your initial audit, the first step is really selecting an audit firm. That's going to be a really important step. How do you do that? I'm sure there's a lot of people out there who are hanging their hat as a highly qualified audit firm. Where, where do we go? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Where where do you start? You really start with preparing a request for proposal. This is a, a really important step that sometime potential client or some of my potential clients miss is that they want to make sure that they're they're going out and asking several qualified firms for proposals for their audits. And if they use a request for proposal format, then they'll be getting um, 
proposals that will come back and they'll all be very comparable because you're asking for the same information. Okay. Yeah, that does make a lot of sense. So how do we compare these proposals? Let's say we get two or three and they're in the right format. What, what do we, how do we know which one's right? So we're, we're first going to, there's actually some tools for requesting the proposals. Oh, And so if you just Google AICPA uh, request for proposal template or just email me at michael at wheelercpa.com and I'd be more than happy to share the template with you. And it, it asks a lot of good questions that that you can compare um, when you get these proposals back. Okay, so I'm sorry, I want to I take a step back there. So I realized that I need to do this, right? And so I'm going to ask for RFPs and you're going to send me a document that is going to allow me to answer the question so that you can make a right proposal or how how does that work? Or is this just so that you're familiar with the template that other people are giving? Yeah, absolutely. So so the template includes a lot of required information that you're going to be re- that our potential clients are going to be requesting from us. So um, it's information such as what is your experience and who do you plan to staff on on the audit? And then it also talks about the company or the organization and states, you know, what, why the reason is for the audit, what the timing is, Hmm. um, when, when do you need the proposals back? When is a decision going to be made? And then when do you actually need audited financial statements completed by? Okay. Well, so we're, we're, uh, we're kind of having an opportunity now to give everybody a little bit more of an expectation. I like when you said right at the beginning, Michael, that, uh, when you're talking about the five second rule book, that, that this is a very emotional thing. And just by walking people through these steps of what's supposed to be in the proposal itself, I'm hoping we'll reduce people's anxiety surrounding this. Me too. It's, a, it's really difficult, especially if somebody hasn't been through an initial audit before. Again, they, there's so much fear around it. And uh, I take an approach of that this is this is very educational. I enjoy working with my clients and teaching them about accounting and about the audit process. So we can take a lot of that anxiety anxiety away. Now, you've talked about peer review reports before. How does that apply here with comparing proposals? Yeah, so when you're comparing proposals, one of the things that um, in the request for proposal and should definitely be included in every proposal that the client's receiving back is that a peer review report. And a peer review report is really like an audit of the CPA firm. And so the report will say either a pass, which means that they're meeting all professional standards. There could be a pass with deficiencies. And so if there's some deficiencies, you want to understand what those deficiencies are and what the firm has done to address those deficiencies. There's also a fail um, Mm -hmm. report. And that basically means that there were some significant deficiencies and the firm did not meet professional standards. And again, if if you're going to consider a firm that has a fail report, you really want to understand the circumstances and understand what the firm has done to to correct those issues and ensure that they won't affect the integrity of your financial statement audit. Now, I, I might sound kind of harsh here, but why would I want to work with a firm that has had a fail from a peer report? I mean, I mean, I know people make mistakes and if there is an action plan to correct those, but wouldn't that make most people nervous? Um, it, it definitely can make people nervous and and there's lots of reasons why a firm could uh, receive a fail report. Okay. And, and again, just understanding the, what the fail report's about. So it could be that they fail because of an audit of an employee benefit plan. Well, an employee benefit plan may not affect everybody's audit because if you're just having a financial statement audit without an employee benefit plan, then there there may be considerations that, that you could still use that firm. I gotcha. Okay. Now, the big picture question here when you're preparing proposals, I'm assuming after you've done your due diligence, which is what we've been talking about, making sure the peer report's done, checking references and all of that stuff, is, is, is cost. 
cost, right? I mean, th- th- there's a fee for this. There is a fee for this. And um, you want to make sure that you understand how many hours the the firm is planning on spending. And so oftentimes we'll provide a, a breakdown of the hours that we're going to be spending by staff level. We try to be as efficient as possible. Um, and most audits are staffed with a one to two staff um, that have experience of, you know, one to two years. And then typically a senior that has three to five years of experience. And then a manager that has five to 15 years of experience. And then also a partner. And we break down uh-huh. those hours and provide that to, to prospective clients to make sure that they understand what our approach is and how much time we plan on spending on it. Um, one thing that's important to ask is how overruns are handled because, um, in an audit, there can be unforeseen issues, um, such as maybe, um, there, there was an account that wasn't reconciled or there was an issue that, that comes across on the audit. And so you want to be able to communicate with the firm and understand how they charge for overruns. And what our firm specifically does is that we will be communicating any types of overruns up front with management and let them know what needs to be corrected and an estimated fee to correct that. And a lot of times we can provide the information to management and they're able to go back and correct that for us and then we can complete our audit. Okay. Sounds like a lot of oversight, Michael. That's really interesting that you have all of those different layers of people to make sure that the audit goes smoothly and that things aren't missed. But I'm sure that there are some firms that might try to cut out some of the upper management or levels of oversight because that's going to reduce the cost. Is that a good idea or how should people view that? That's a really good point, Matt. And honestly, we all make mistakes, right? I, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm guilty of it. And so that's why we have those layers of review. It, a staff person can prepare something and they have a few years of experience and they may miss some of the, the bigger picture or, or miss a specific item that they should have caught. And then that will go through several layers of review and then finally signed off by the partner in charge of the audit, which in, an audits performed by Wheeler is going to be me. Mm-hmm. And so having those layers of review really ensure that, that you have integrity in the audit and that um, things are well documented and and mistakes uh, don't occur as, as often as it could and if things are not properly reviewed. But if we do cut out some of the layers that you provide at Wheeler, that will reduce the overall fees because this is generally bundled with an hourly sort of hourly and staff like you were explaining. So talk to me about, you know, sometimes the highest price not might not be the best, sometimes the lowest price not be the best. But honestly, a lot of people really focus on cost as such a huge decision making um, kind of tool. Help us understand that aspect of this, if you don't mind. Yeah, the, the low cost leader is often not the right choice because they are typically needing to cut corners and not providing the service that um, most clients would would expect and or at least hope for from their auditors. I know that I have experienced in the past where other firms will provide an initial request list and that initial request list has just it's just pages and pages long, and it's not completely applicable to the mm. client. And what we do is we make sure that we go through and we try to make it a very efficient process for the client. So we make sure our initial request list has specifics on the things that we need. We provide templates to, to help the, the clients to prepare for their audits. And so when you go with a firm that's maybe the low cost, cost leader, you're probably not going to get the service that that you need. And and it could take longer. And there might be a lot more work on on your end. Well, it would make me nervous as a business owner that if I needed uh, to have this financial statement audit happen, there's a lot riding on this. And so I would be afraid that if I didn't have somebody who was thorough and I did turn this into like a lender requirement and they said, well, hey, bud, you're missing A, B and C, 
then that's actually just going to increase the overall cost and stress that I'm going through anyway, wouldn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And so I've seen that in the past where maybe a balance sheet is out of balance, but Mm -hmm. yet it's a audited financial statements. And and so those, those would be embarrassing things that would take a lot of explanation. I actually just completed an audit for a client that had a requirement to submit it to the Department of real estate and they had already had another firm perform the audit and when they submitted that audit to the department of real estate the department of real estate came back and said oh i'm sorry this Mm -hmm. firm is not licensed and so we had to perform a whole new audit and they had to pay for that over again Mm -hmm. so again doing your homework doing a comparison and making sure that you get the the important information to be able to decide on an auditor is is key. You had just said that one of the things that you provide at Wheeler are some templates. And so the last part of this podcast, episode 14 today, is going to be preparation for the audit. And then we're going to have episode 15, which is when Michael and I are going to dive deeper into what actually happens during the audit. But in preparation, you provide specific things for your clients to make sure that they can be as well prepared as possible, correct? Absolutely. And so some of the things that we stress in in preparing for an audit is making sure that that you're going through all of your significant accounts and making sure that they're reconciled. So this includes bank accounts and investment accounts, your receivable aging, your prepaids, your accounts payables, all of your loans, and making sure that they tie out to the supporting documentation, that there's not any significant uh, reconciling items that cannot be explained or significant differences. Let's go back to the five second rule. This is probably where everybody's heart rate goes through the roof, right? So, okay, well, I figured out who I know I need it. Now I know who I'm going to use. What are some of the other things that you do in preparing and not just the hard numbers and all of the documentation? What are some of the things that you do to help calm people down and have them realize that they are going to be well prepared and they are, this is going to be a, a much less painful process than they might think. Yeah. As, as I have mentioned before, we, we provide a very comprehensive initial request list and we also provide templates to help with the reconciliations and mm-hmm. help gather the information. And we also work with management. So we have a planning meeting with management to go through all the items that we will need for the audit make sure that they don't have any questions or concerns. And so then they are able to to gather all of their agreements and they're able to go through their property and equipment schedules, making sure that they're complete and they've done all of their disposals, which actually is kind of funny because We've seen a lot of property and equipment schedules that have very old things on it. So Mm -hmm. seriously, we don't use VCRs anymore. Please make sure that those parts are taken off there. Oh, that's funny. Um, it, only active equipment should be on your property and equipment listing. Gotcha. Well, I don't know if everybody listening has noticed this, but throughout this interview today and throughout the podcast, one of the things that happens with Michael is just the way he's communicating these very complex issues and things that you have to prepare, he's doing it in a way that seems very calming. I mean, do you ever get that feedback, Michael? that just how you present this stuff calms people down just by the nature of who you are? I, I do actually get that comment a lot from my uh, my clients. They, they always joke with me, and um, I've had a couple of them say, you know, I used to fear audits, but now I'm like excited to have the auditors <laughs> come. I really enjoy working with you guys. So uh, that, that makes me feel good. It's something I really, really enjoy doing. I love working with my clients and I love educating them on, on these complex topics. Fantastic. Well, we're going to probably leave it there. Is there anything else that we need to talk about in preparation before we jump into podcast number 15? which we'll be talking about what happens during the audit, finalizing the audit, and after the audit. Is there anything we need to cover still today? Yeah, I'm looking forward to, to having a deeper dive and discussion on, on those topics as well. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Matt. Thank you very much for your time today, and we'll see you guys on the other side of the mic soon.